Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Cody Firearms Museum, part of the Buffalo Bill Center for the West here in Cody, Wyoming, and I am taking a look at part of their gun collection today. Now they have a lot of the Winchester, well they have all of the Winchester collection, which means they have a lot of interesting prototypes. Among those are these two guns. These are Winchester G30M rifles. Now, this is the third video in a series looking at the progression of this gun design. So if you haven't seen the first two, the first one is on the Colt model of 1929, and the second one is on the G30, as designed by Ed Browning. So, we're at this point in the story where Ed Browning presented this design to Winchester, they bought it, they agreed to pay him royalties, although within his lifetime the gun never went into significant production. And in 1939, he unfortunately passed away. At that point, Winchester still wanted to develop this rifle. They thought it had a lot of potential. Uh, the military thought it had a lot of potential, but it was kind of being held back by its gas system. It had this unusual annular gas piston. And apparently Ed Browning really liked this system and didn't want to let it go. And when he died, it in some ways it freed up the gun design. Winchester was able to get rid of that annular gas system and replace it with something a little more feasible. So what they did initially was actually replace it with a long stroke gas piston, kind of like an M1. And right about this time they also hired on a guy named David Marshall Williams. Now uh, David Williams, or as he's colloquially known, Carbine Williams, uh, is popularly recognized as the guy who invented the M1 carbine. Now his work on the M1 carbine is a little bit exaggerated, and in fact, it actually traces back to these two guns. So what Williams designed was this Tappet gas system. Uh, I should point out, because otherwise everyone will say it in the comments below. Uh, Carbine Williams was a convicted bootlegger. Uh, he was a felon. Uh, he did gun design as well. And he was actually a reasonably, a fairly talented gun designer. Uh, he was a little bit erratic to work with, um, short temper, not necessarily always easy to work with, but he had good ideas. Um, good enough that Winchester employed him for about 10 years. So one of the first things he did for them was he designed this gas tappet system. And we'll take a close look at that in this rifle in a minute, but the short version is it's basically a gas piston that can only travel about a tenth of an inch, that's about two or three millimeters. And, and that tappet, that little short traveling piston, moves back very quickly and it smacks an operating rod which then, under residual inertia, travels all the way back, cycles the firearm. Uh, this allows them a little more, the system gives you a little bit better control over uh, varied pressure of ammunition. Um, you have a situation where once that tappet has moved its very short distance, it stops. It has nowhere to go. It cannot further accelerate the operating parts of the gun if you happen to have a higher pressure cartridge than normal. So a lot of things going for this system. And while they had experimented with a long stroke gas piston in the G30, uh, with that development from Williams, that, that went into this gun. They ditched the long stroke piston, put in that, and that, that created the G30M. Uh, this rifle still has a tilting bolt to lock, uh, which is what Ed Browning had designed it with. And at this point, they made three of them and sent them off for inspection uh, with the military. This is the spring and summer of 1940. Now, uh, Edwin Pugsley, who was uh, one of the heads at Winchester at the time, did try to sell this rifle to the U.S. Army. Uh, he came up with a number of reasons why he said this was a better gun for them than the M1 Garand. Uh, Winchester, for quite a while, harbored this suspicion that the M1 was they were kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, that something wasn't going to work right. Um, here's a good example. In one of his letters to the Army, Pugsley mentions that one of the problems with the M1 is that it is too easy to disassemble. He says disassembling a G30 fully requires a screwdriver or, and, and tools, which makes it superior to the M1. Now if you think about it, the M1 Garand is really only held together by the trigger guard. It's this spring steel trigger guard and you pull it back and then open it up, and once you open it up, the trigger, the, the whole trigger assembly comes out of the gun, and then the stock and the action break apart. And there are no other physical connections holding the gun together. If that trigger guard had been designed poorly so that it didn't have enough tension, you could easily have been in a situation where you could fire an M1 and the trigger, the recoil would cause the trigger guard to disconnect, and then the trigger falls out of the gun, and then the front end of the barrel cantilevers off the front, and you could get like you know, a lethal weapon-like scene where you pull the trigger and the whole gun just goes and explodes apart on you. Um, 
And that's a valid concern at first until the M1 is actually in huge, large-scale production and it becomes very clear that, okay, they, they got that bit right and this isn't the problem. So anyway, Winchester had this combination of the, corp the company itself, a lot of the, the engineers and the, the administrative heads, had inspected the M1. Winchester was starting to work uh, to manufacture M1s for the military and they really had some hesitation. Uh, legitimate hesitation that this gun might not really work out. So they wanted to have an alternative to sell. At the same time, they also realized that that might not happen. It might work, or even if it didn't work well, the Army might stick with it anyway. And they wanted to have a gun that they could sell. Uh, they can't get commercial rights to sell the M1, but they do own this design from Ed Browning. And for example, the Canadian military uh, expressed some, uh, some interest in these guns. So Winchester wanted to have a product they could offer to people like that. One of the major events in the development of the G30M here was in November of 1940 when the U.S. Marine Corps held its own rifle trials. This is, we're kind of still in the middle of the, the big debacle between Garand and Johnson. Uh, Melvin Johnson had a semi-automatic rifle that he also thought was better than the M1 and that he wanted to have adopted either as a replacement or as a substitute side-by-side -side standard with the M1. And that's, that's a controversy that's raging. It got out into the public and into Congress and it was kind of a mess. Well, Winchester kind of pushed themselves into that argument as well with this rifle, with the G30. So in late 1940, when the Marine Corps did its own rifle trials, because the Marine Corps adopted weapons independently of the Army, the Army already had adopted the M1, the Marines hadn't. Um, when they did their trials, they had, uh, they had a 1903 Springfield as a control, because that's what they had been using up to that point. They had M1 Garand rifles, they had 1940, or they had developmental versions of the Johnson rifle, obviously not M1941s, but, uh, and, they had Winchester G30s, just a couple of them. And as it turned out, the Winchester actually did remarkably well. It did very well. Um, uh, some of the guys in the Marine Corps testing were actually really enthusiastic about this rifle. But they didn't buy it. Um, ultimately, the fact that the Army had adopted the M1, the M1 didn't do badly in this test. It's more that the Winchester did better than people might have expected, not that the M1 did any worse than expected. And the Marine Corps ended up adopting the M1, which Really, even if it had been the inferior rifle by some slight margin, it makes sense that the Army and the Marines use the same guns. Uh, it's easier to produce you know, one rifle throughout American industry than to try and have multiples. Everything's simpler that way. So the Marine Corps did that. Uh, but they kept, they encouraged, um, they, they still liked the Winchester, the G30. So the Canadian, interestingly at this point, the Canadian government expressed a formal interest in the rifle Winchester asked for permission to demonstrate it to the Canadians, and they were turned down, interestingly. Uh, the, the U.S. government would not let them demonstrate the G30 to Canada, most likely because the government didn't want Winchester getting sidetracked with production for some other country. They wanted Winchester right where they were, making as many M1 Garands for the U.S. as possible. Because this is right about the time that Winchester does, in fact, get a contract to manufacture M1s. So. With all of that history in mind, why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at, we'll take this one apart. This one's a little tight and locked up. Um, but we'll pull this one apart and take a look at all the internals and you can see exactly how it works. So here, I pulled this one back out as a, just as a sample to show you. This is one of the early Ed Browning prototypes um, of the G30. So if you haven't seen this video, go back and check it out. But you can see, looking at these two side by side, they share the same basic operating mechanism. The bolts lock up right here. They're both tilting bolts. Now they've made the receiver a bit bigger up here. One of the in other interesting things to look at is the surviving prototype G30s from the Browning era where they have this annular gas piston. The stocks are all trashed. They're all cracked up. Um, both back here at the wrist, here on the side. And with the G30M, the stocks got substantially wider. Um, you can see it there when you handle the guns. It's really evident that these M, the, the improved, the modernized model, uh, is really substantially heavier. And at the same time, these guns went through a bunch of testing and lo and behold, the stocks aren't cracked up. So now we have two different versions of the G30M here. There were apparently three of these made and two of them survive, which is pretty cool just by itself. They both have detachable magazines, although this one is fitted with a flush magazine that's three or five rounds. This one has an extended magazine, and boy, it's a different looking sort of magazine. It appears here that they decided that a curved magazine would work better than a straight one, 
These are both in 30 out six, by the way, standard 30 out six army ball ammunition. Um, but rather than stamp a brand new magazine, it looks like they took a BAR magazine and cut slices of it and then welded them together. You can see the welds here and uh, turned it into a curved magazine. Uh, really quite, quite something. That's definitely a prototype sort of deal there. You know. uh, the rear sights on these guns are also both a little bit different. This one's a little bit reminiscent of an M1 Garand rear sight. Uh, they're both apertures, but this one works a bit differently. You know. And lastly, of course, this gun is missing a few of its front end components. This one, however, is in fantastic shape. This has an aperture sight here. This is kind of a quintessential typical military sight. The sight lifts up and you've got a second aperture here. You can run it out to uh, 1600 yards or flip it down for the battle sight. Um, this one does have a fully intact front end including a bayonet lug, all that stuff. Now we can see it cycling here. You see as I start to pull the gas, the, the charging handle back, the rear of the bolt drops down cycles like that and as with the earlier browning guns the bolt actually drops down into the the back of the the wrist basically the receiver continues back here and the bolt comes down into this area so let's go ahead and take this apart and check out the internals so we need to take the front end bits off there is a cross pin here interestingly they actually used a captive pin instead of a screw so i'm going to use the cap of my universal disassembly tool. Just push that through. Comes out here. We'll pull that out until it locks in place. And then just gently wiggle that off. There we go. That comes free. And then we have a typical spring-loaded uh, catch for the rear barrel band. So we can pull that off. Now with the front end disassembled, I can just lift the handguard off. Now we're getting there. We also Once the nose cap is off, the stock just pivots off the gun and opens up. There we go. Now we've got our whole action available there. We can set the stock aside. Before I put the stock aside completely, I want to point out that the spring, the recoil spring for this gun is located in the stock. It's this big square hole right there is a captive recoil spring. So uh, the Browning early guns had the recoil spring attached here to the back of the receiver. They got rid of that. They separated it. There's now a tail on the bolt, which you can see coming out right here. This impinges on the recoil spring in the stock, and that's what gives the action its uh, motive force. Magazine. This is a really tight magazine and because it's flush fitting I have a hard time pulling it out without being able to push it from the top. So the magazine release is once again right here in the trigger guard. If we push that in, there we go. Pull out the magazine. It's kind of funny. It looks like it's actually slightly longer at the front than it is at the back. This is a modified BAR mag. Um, they have added a tab right here on the follower and that activates a hold open. So this button right here is your bolt hold open. So it'll lock open on an empty magazine, or if you want to lock the bolt open without a mag, hold the bolt, pull the bolt back, push this up, and then it will go to that point and no farther forward. In fact, you can see when I've got pressure on it, it holds that up. When I pull the bolt back, it drops down under spring pressure. So the way you would reload this, this tab would lock the gun open, you'd pull the magazine out, you'd put a new mag in, and then pull the bolt handle just slightly back to allow this to drop and then the bolt would close on the magazine charging it with a new round. Now we looked at this at the very end of the last video on the G30. The way the bolt actually locks is very reminiscent of the Model 1911 pistol that Ed Browning's half-brother John Moses Browning designed. Alright, so there are two swinging links here. There's one and there's one and these connect the bolt itself to this operating slide so that when the slide moves, the bolt has to go with it. That's, that's pretty elementary. And they pretty much just push the bolt until you get to this point, where when the bolt stops moving, it's going to come up here and right about there. Now, the bolt has to move up against the receiver. It's going to lock. Let's see if we can get a better view of it. And 
not really. It's gonna, the locking surface is right about here. And what happens is the operating slide goes the rest of the way forward and those two pivoting links force the bolt up into battery. Then when the slide comes back, here it is fully forward, and as it starts to come back right there, it, those swinging links are going to drag the bolt down and then pull it back. This is just like how the barrel and slide interact on a 1911 pistol. Now the actual gas system is right here. We have a gas port about a third of the way down the barrel. This little cylindrical bit is the gas piston and it appears to be fully uh, in, the, in the retracted position all the way in that way at the moment. Um, I suspect it's frozen up from being, having been fired decades ago and then left. Uh, carbon has probably hardened it up. What would normally happen, we have the bolt fully in battery. So there's the bolt locked up. And you can see that this slide is in contact with that gas tap at piston. When you fire, gas comes out the barrel right here, hits that piston, forces it back only about that far. And it, it gives a good hard whack to this operating slide. It can only go that far, then the piston stops. The slide then has enough energy to continue moving back on its own, pull the bolt out of battery, cycle it all the way back, eject the empty case, and then this tail is being pushed on by the spring in the stock. That forces everything back the other direction. The bolt goes forward, locks up. This is now back in contact with the gas tappet ready to cycle again. So there you go. There is the disassembled Winchester G30M rifle. So this is a marriage of Ed Browning's tilting bolt locking system, which is also partially inspired by his, br his half-brother's 1911 pistol, combined with David Williams' gas tappet action system. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm really enjoying this series on this progression through Ed Browning and David Marshall Williams and looking at all of this work from Winchester that really ended up, well, it got them the M1 carbine, but as a 30 caliber full power rifle, this, they, they kept trying and they kept making better and better guns, but it never quite worked for them. They never got onto the market. So I would like to thank the Cody Firearms Museum for letting me take a look at these and letting me take apart this one. Uh, if you're ever in the area, up in Wyoming, definitely uh, plan to take some time at the Cody Museum. They have a fantastic and extensive collection that is well worth visiting. And if you like this sort of content, please consider checking out my Patreon account. It is funding from folks like you at a measly buck a month that makes it possible for me to travel to places like Wyoming and bring you guns like these. Thanks for watching.